I'm so encouraged. Uh, we had to change the location of reading with the rector because so many people want to gather together on a Friday night and to talk about prayer together. So please, if you can't make it, still consider picking up the book. I would encourage you. I know maybe some of my book choices over the years. If you don't know my title, it's rector. It's just a case way. It's a, it's a rhyming way of saying reading with the pastor. Uh, some of my books have been really theological over the years. This book is really practical. So if you do struggle with prayer in any way, I'd encourage you to pick it up, whether or not you can be with us on Friday night. Um, but first, let's start with prayer, because today we're going to talk about one of those reasons why praying is hard. It's kind of hard to hear. Maybe great praying is hard, and you have all the singing we're doing. That's what we're going to talk about today. <laughs> so let's pray. And I just gave away my intro a little screw it anyway. Uh, let's pray. We'll get into it. Lord, Lord, we come before you in boldness, knowing that through you our sins are forgiven. We are not defined by them. And yet, while our sins are forgiven, they often interrupt communion with you, the life we were meant to live, to be with you. Lord, would you give us the boldness of repentance, the boldness of turning to you, and turning from our sins. Amen. You know, even though I just gave it away, I still think we can ask the question, what keeps you from praying? What keeps you from praying? I asked this to the, a group of men at the church two weeks ago, and we gathered together at the circle home. And the answers were all over the place, and they're all ones that I can understand. The, the first one and the most understandable one is just pure busyness. I have so many things on my calendar. I don't have time to think, let alone think with God. I'm so busy, I don't have time to pray. Others of you might feel ill-equipped to pray. Maybe you weren't raised in a Christian home, or you've seen other people have a deep relationship with God and say, every time I try to, I feel inauthentic, I feel like a phony, I don't have the technique and the skills I need to be someone who knows how to pray. Others of you might just feel like prayer doesn't work. The cumulative impact of disappointment where you prayed again and again and received no response in your mind of this. Let me give up on praying. And all those, I think, are legitimate struggles with prayer. Those are things I can resonate with all. My schedule is overly full because for many years I viewed that as a virtue. The virtue of Littleton is business, by the way. It's not a vice, it's a virtue. I understand at times too that feeling of technique. I don't I just don't know how to pray right now. Or even the cumulative impact of disappointment is it gonna do any good. But what if what if one of the key reasons why prayer is so hard in your life. And why prayer as conversation, not merely you talking to God, but hearing Him speak to you, is because of the habitual, unrepentant sin in your life. The sin in your life that drowns out the voice of God. The sin in your life that's like that white noise in the background that is always there, you can never quite get rid of, and there's a reason you can't hear God speaking to you. The elephant in the room that desperately needs to be addressed for you and God to have an authentic relationship with one another, but you just can't seem to get around to work up the courage to confess. Today what I want to do is we continue our sermon series on the practices of prayer, is look at the practice of repentance as a key component of life with God. We were created for life with God. It's your highest end. It's what you were made for. And in our relationships in life, what do we know? If there is something between you and somebody else that is, goes unaddressed over the years, authentic relationships becomes increasingly difficult. This is why many of us can't stand family reunions. Because your childhood wounds with your parents have never been articulated. That they've never sought repentance and reconciliation with you. And so your conversations are judiciously avoiding the one thing you know you need to address. And you wonder why you don't want to be there. 
And so often that exact dynamic happens in our prayer life. There's something we've yet to give over to God, something we've yet to repent of, and there's this unspoken wedge that has been formed that you just can't seem to get around because you're unwilling to go through the process of healing, reconciliation, which requires repentance on your behalf. And so today what I want to do is I want to look in a passage that might not feel like it applies, but I promise you it does. We're going to look at 2 Chronicles 6. That'll be our primary passage today. And that's when Solomon dedicates the temple to Yahweh. This is the very height of the Old Testament. It's all leading to this point. And he dedicates the temple, and the first way he dedicates the temple, all of his first prayers are not, hey God, you know, whenever we pray to this temple, may we defeat our enemies. Would you bring crops? Would you prosper the land? The first prayers he prays over the temple is when we screw up and we confess it to you and pray to this temple, toward it, we're praying to you, but toward the temple, would you hear our prayers, forgive us, and heal our relationship? The temple, the dwelling place of God, is a place where there might be healed due to a relational rift, but that requires an act of repentance on behalf of Israel. So before I want to get to that, this is what I want to do today. It's a bit of theologizing, it's a bit of trinity. For any period of time, you might say, well, that's that's one of you. Others of you might say, well, I've never heard this before. We're going to talk about the central place of the temple as the central theme of the entire Bible. Temple just means dwelling with God. God dwells with us in the temple. And we're going to look at how from beginning to end, the Bible is one story about God's choice to dwell with his people. Then we're going to look at the central practice of repentance in the temple. That dwelling with God necessitates us engaging in a path of repentance so our relationship with him might be healed. But then third, I want to look at the role of Jesus with our great high priest. That you don't come to God in repentance wondering if he might we have this in our relationships with one another. If I fully repent and fully seek forgiveness, they might say no. In the gift of Christ Jesus, is that God doesn't say no to us. And what that does is it actually frees us to engage in a process of repentance that doesn't lead to shame, but leads to healing. So first, let's look at the big picture theology of the Bible. Now, there's a lot of ways you can say the Bible is this overarching book about all of these different things. You know, the mighty acts of God to redeem his people. That's what I've heard over the years. Those are all legitimate. I'm not trying to say that there's only one way you interpret this story, right? It's not like you open up a, a great book and say, this is the meaning of this text, and there can be no other uh, grand narratives within it. But one of the central ones that we often miss is 21st century Christians is the centrality of the temple. Greg Beals, probably my favorite biblical scholar, at least in the United States right now, is a Presbyterian guy. I can't remember where he is. Maybe he's a Westminster. His book, um, New Testament Biblical Theology, which is mostly about the Old Testament, believe it or not, uh, I think is the most helpful on this. And he points out that the garden itself has to be viewed as a temple. Now, most simply put, it's a temple because that's where God dwelled, right? He walked with his people in the cool of the day. God, people, together, temple. But then when you actually look at the details of the garden, you start to see even more temple imagery. For starters, it's on a mountain. We often don't think, we don't realize this. It's on a high place. And all throughout the Old Testament, temples are always set on a high place. The temple mount in Israel, but also when God meets Moses, where does he meet him? On Mount Sinai. Whenever God meets with his people, they somehow or another always end up on a mountain. You know, maybe that should be a part of your weekend liturgy and going up on a high place and meeting with God. This is all temple. You also see in the temple, and if you're interested, email me, I can give you all these scripture references. I'm just going to insert them today. If you want to see them, I can show them to you later. Um, but if you look at like the, the way the Bible describes the inside of the temple, it's almost all the temple imagery. 
plants, animals, trees, water is flowing. There's a feast in there with the showbread. Solomon's temple is a reflection back upon the first temple of the garden. And I, one I find almost the most fascinating is the way that Adam is described. The Hebrew words for when he's set in the garden, he's, he's committed to cultivate and, and, and keep it. Those are the exact same words used to describe the priests, the Levitical priests, and their work in the temple throughout the Old Testament. Cultivate and keep can also be described as like serving God. So what you see is that the garden is a temple where God is with his people. God with his people is how the scriptures began. But then you see when we fell into sin, does God leave us? No, he rather he searches us down. And we see in Exodus 25, 8, the tabernacle is described as what? God with his people. Uh, Exodus 25, 8, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. <coughs> tabernacle, God dwelling with his people. Then 2 Chronicles 7, where God descends upon his temple, says this, as soon as Solomon finished his prayer, fire came down from heaven, consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple, and the priests could not enter the house of the Lord, because the glory of the Lord filled the Lord's house. When all the people of Israel saw the fire come down to the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed down with their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshipped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. The temple, what happens? God's glory fills it. Now this is one I think you've heard me talk about almost every Advent. But John 1.14, Jesus is described as <coughs> the one who tabernacles amongst us, God dwelling with his people. Jesus uh, says this, um, and the word became flesh and dwelt, and that word we describe as well is actually tabernacle. John made it up, so he didn't have a better word, among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus reveals an extension of the Bible. God wants to be with his people. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. Where is the temple now? We are the temple of the living God. As the Holy Spirit descends upon us and fills us with his presence. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? Who you have from God? You are not your own. For you were walking with the Christ, so glorify God in your body. What do we see here? God now dwells in us by the Holy Spirit. And one of the pieces we often miss, the day of Pentecost. Do you remember what happens to God's people? Fire is on the top of their heads. Do you remember what happens in 2 Chronicles 7 when God enters the temple? Fire enters the temple. <laughs> This is the revelation of the new temple of God in his people. God dwelling within us by his spirit and power. But then all of this is moving towards the great hope that we have in Revelation 41. And how does God describe his return? Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Her parents of bride and born for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with humanity. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. From the beginning to the end, it is all about God choosing to dwell with his people. It's all about the temple. And so with this in mind, let's turn to 2 Chronicles 6. 2 Chronicles 6, where Solomon dedicates the temple to Yahweh. Now, if you were to ask any of us, what is the most important thing that happens in the Old Testament? What is the thing that Tim quotes the most? You probably wouldn't say 2 Chronicles 6. You'd say, well, Tim quotes 
Genesis 1, 2, and 3 a whole lot. And we're a reformed church, so we talk a whole lot about God calling Abraham out of nothing. Right? I quote that all the time. He talks a whole lot about Moses and the, the, um, uh, the, the exodus, of an image of slavery, death, and resurrection. But if you were to ask an ancient Jew, what is the most important part of the Old Testament? What is it all leading toward? What is the crescendo of this whole story? They would say Solomon's temple. If you ask a modern Orthodox Jew, what are you trying to get in life? They would say a return to Solomon's temple. This is the high point of the Old Testament. This is what is all leading toward. In Solomon, after his whole life's work, after his father's whole life's work, the temple is finally built, God dwelling with his people, and what are the first prayers he prays over it? What is the first word he says over this temple? Well, it's not quite the first word, it's right up there. The first thing he talks about is God, now that this temple is here, when we screw up, not if, when, in your people, turn from their sin, Pray to you toward this temple. Would you forgive us? And would you restore us to the right relationship with you? At the very heart of the Old Testament temple is the path of repentance, the path of confession, the path that leads to healing, which is confessing our sins, having them atoned for, so that the Father might bring us back into life with Him. Look at 2 Chronicles 6, verse 24. Uh, through 2018. And I promise you, he just keeps going on and on about this. I mean, it's like a whole chapter where he's like, when we do this sin, forgive us. When we do that sin, forgive us. I mean, he has a very low view of his people. Let's just put it that way. As the king, he's like, I know these people, God. We need this. There's a lot of things we could screw up. And they do all of them, by the way, if you read the Old Testament. It says this, if your people Israel are defeated before an enemy because they have sinned against you, and they turn again and acknowledge your name and pray and plead with you in this house. Then hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your people, Israel, and bring them again to the land that you gave to them and to their fathers. When heaven is shut up and there's no rain because they have sinned against you, if they pray for this place and acknowledge your name and turn from their sin when you would afflict them, then hear in heaven and forgive the sin of your servants, your people, Israel, and you teach them the good way in which you should walk. They should walk and grant rain upon your land, which you have given to your people as an inheritance. And I promise you, it just keeps going on and on like this. It should be striking to us that when Israel finally hits what feels like the finish line, we're in the land, our enemies have been conquered and they are gone. We finally have a temple. When that happens, Solomon prays to God. When we <laughs> mess this up, and we pray for forgiveness, and we seek repentance, hear our prayer, and restore us in the life of you. Why is this the first prayer he offers? Because the temple is meant to be the revelation of life with God. And in our lives, we know this. When there is something between us and a friend, between us and a spouse, between us and an extended family member, when it is not confessed, repented of, forgiven, it cannot be healed. And that relationship will then be characterized by judicious avoidance of the how many of you have known there's something wrong with respect to the marriage for a moment? Maybe wrong in, in the marriage, or there's a misalignment, and you're like, what we should do is just go get time together. We're going to go on a date. But you don't actually address the issue. Does that actually sort things out? No. All it does is kick it down the road so that that problem just compounds later. It's not addressed. We have it in our families, too. I mentioned it in the sermon intro, but many of us feel this. We dread 
for what the family reunion is. You deserve it before death. Where you cannot be authentically yourself around. Because there is a sin that has been committed that has not been repented of, and therefore forgiveness has not been extended, and healing is impossible. And so what we do is our relationships become characterized by avoidance rather than resistance. And many of our prayer lives are characterized by avoidance rather than intimacy. Because we have something in our life that we have yet to repent of. Something in our life that we don't think we can live without. Some resentment that is festered and preoccupies our mental life. Some lack of forgiveness that we are carrying around. Or some habitual sin that we develop as a coping mechanism for the pains of this world. There are things that we have yet to repent of that create a block in our relationships with God. I had this in my sermon, but I took it out because for the sake of time, I can't go into all the detail. But I encourage you, take a look at Genesis chapter 3. After the fall, God goes walking in the garden in the pool of the day and starts looking for Adam and Eve. How we need to define, often how we define prayer is us talking to God. I hope you understand, prayer is anytime we are talking with God. Here's an example that might shock you. Every engagement the disciples had with Jesus was by definition prayer. They were talking with God. When God meets Moses in the burning bush and speaks to him out of the burning bush and Moses speaks back, that definitionally is prayer. It's talk with God. Okay? So the very first all the prayers in all of Scripture are Adam and Eve trying to explain themselves to God about their fall. So God comes and seeks them out. The very first prayer, right, is God seeking out his people. That should tell us something. That is the posture that God is going to have throughout the rest of the Bible, seeking out his people. He knows where they are. He doesn't need to ask. But what is he showing? He's the God who seeks. And when he finds Adam, the first prayer conversation starts. Adam says, I was, uh, I'm naked, and so I hid. Right? Remember that? I realized I was naked and I hid. The first prayers offered to God are true. He was naked. They are true. He hid. But what is he doing? He is judiciously avoiding the sinful reality of I have rebelled against you. So many of our prayers can be true, they can be honest, and yet they are still avoided. And it says, who told you that? Right? You know, uh, and then, you know, we open up. Whoops. That cuts it perfect there. All right. Um, who told you that? You know, oh, that woman you gave me, you gave me the fruit, and I ate it. Again, true. That happened. Avoided. Eve. I was just eating. That happened. But what does their prayer miss? In three times, Adam offers two prayers and Eve offers one. What is absolutely absent is what we see Solomon doing in the temple. Repentance and turning to God for healing is completely absent. Adam and Eve's first response should have been, oh, thank God you are here. We made a massive mistake. I have these new feelings. I don't know what to do with them. I, I, I don't know how to cope with what is happening to me. God, you have to do something. We rebelled against you, and now we're living with the consequences. And my only path back would be if you intervene, do something in me, but someone's got to fix this. And it's precisely what they did. And so what we see Solomon doing is undoing the sin of Adam. That now when humanity dwells with God, they can actually address their failures rather than being avoided of them. To seek, seek his healing and restored relationship. Brothers and sisters, I, I know, I know that you guys have sin in your life, as do I. Do you really believe this blocking relationship with God? But here's something I wonder if you might be thinking. 
in this life, if we confess our wrongs to someone, just to feel it, they might reject us. They might say, yeah, you are wrong. You were wrong in all of those things, and I'm not in a place to ever restore a relationship with you. You have crossed the threshold of what I can forgive. And I think one of the reasons we don't confess our sins to one another and we don't seek healing is because we're so terrified that the response might be complete lack of forgiveness. And then we finally know, oh, the relationship is beyond repair. So I'd rather live with this like halfway relationship than the honesty of knowing I can't be healed. And so what we do is so often we project that on God. Can I really bring where I'm at to him? Or do I need to like bring like these candy coated struggles to God? We often teach one another how to pray to God. And we often teach one another how to pray avoiding prayers to God, thinking he can't actually handle the deaths of your sin and the deaths of your wrong and repentance. And so this is why we need Hebrews 10. This is why we need the assurance and the confidence that we have actually been forgiven in Christ Jesus. That we can actually boldly confess and boldly repent, knowing that our Father will not turn us away. What we are not doing here is confessing so that you know we can have hopes that like maybe God will like me again. He already likes you. The reality is your sin is what is blocking you from the relationship with him. But his posture towards you is always forgiveness. Reconciliation, love, if you are found in his son, Christ Jesus. Hebrews 10 says this. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us, that is through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. And our bodies washed with pure water. What's the invitation of prayer? Come to Jesus with your guilt. Come to Jesus with your shame. Come to Jesus with your repentance. Come to Jesus with your confession. And he won't turn you away. He will give you forgiveness. He will heal you. He will reconcile you. He will remove your sins as far away from you as the east is from the West, and he can carry you into an authentic and intimate relationship with God. But there is a path. And that path begins with repentance. Brothers and sisters, what sin has a hold of your heart? Not the one that you see all the time. Those ones are easy. The one that's seven layers deep that is driving you. He asks us, bring that to me. It won't shock me. I already know it's there. I know it a lot better than you do. And I can actually receive it. And I can forgive you because of my son, Jesus. And I can restore you, restore you with an authentic relationship. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, we were made to live with God. Prayer is simply the revelation of God. <laughs> Where do you need to be in order to have that relationship? Lord God, we thank you for the gift of assurance <laughs> that you will you will restore, you will bring life. And Lord, with that assurance, give us boldness to confess and to turn to you. Lord, we want to hear your voice. We want to be with you. We want to dwell with you. By your Holy Spirit, would you put to death sin in our lives that we can more fully step into life. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.